Ave Maria. Our, our blessed Lord is on the mountain, the Mount of Beatitudes. He has just delivered the Beatitudes and also the explanation of the Beatitudes. That is how we are to apply them to our lives. And on the Mount of Beatitudes, great crowds had gathered and they had listened to him, in essence, proclaiming his divinity because of the manner in which he delivered the Beatitudes. He said, you have heard it said to men of old that you shall not kill or commit adultery and so on. And then he says, but I say to you. Now God had given the commandments. And only God can change the commandments or expand the commandments. And our Lord was doing exactly that. God, has said, God said to Moses, but I say. And therefore he is making himself to be the one who had spoken to Moses. And so coming down the mountain, we're told that great multitudes followed him. And because, perhaps because of the way our Lord had spoken, there were some who were convinced that he, indeed he was God. And in the two miracles that follow, it's evident that the leper believed him to be God as well as the centurion. Although the centurion was in Capernaum, our Lord had not yet gone to Capernaum, but the news had already spread. And so, we're told, behold, the leper came and adored him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. What is he saying? My being cleansed of leprosy depends entirely on your will. But on whose will does the curing of any disease depend, if not God's? Leprosy was the worst disease that could befall a person in ancient times, especially among the Jews. Because not only of the physical consequences, namely the, the body itself literally rotting, there was the physical pain that went with it. There was the psychological distress that accompanied it. But there were also social repercussions. The leper was excluded from the society of Israel. He could not mix with people. So, for instance, he couldn't go to, to the market. He couldn't live with other people. But even worse, he could not go to the temple. And therefore, he could not worship. He was not permitted to offer sacrifice. And so, having been a leper was a situation of, of great grief, sorrow, pain, and bordering on despair. And so when the leper approached our Lord, he was really, at the end of it, he knew that only God could heal him. Only God could remove him from that situation. And so he says, if you will, if you want to, you can heal me. He didn't say, you will ask God. But he said, you can do it because he believed him to be God. If we think of Naaman, the Syrian, who was also a leper, he went to um, Elisha. What did he say when Elisha said to him, go and bathe in the Jordan? I thought he would come out, he would look at the spot, and he would ask his God. But this leper doesn't. He says, if you want to, you can do it. And so the Lord immediately stretched forth his hand and touched him. Now anyone who touched the leper was unclean. But not so for our Lord. He touches him and he said, I will. It does depend on me. He didn't say, I will ask the Father, but I will. Be thou made clean and forthwith his leprosy left him. So the um, 
God, the, the, so the, so Christ willed it and it happened. He spoke and the sickness departs. But our Lord gives the leper instructions now. And we shouldn't just bypass. There's, there's specific reasons why he did so. And Jesus said to him, See, you tell no man, but go and show yourself to the priests and offer the gift which Moses commanded as a testimony. For it. So, one, do not speak to anybody. Two, go to the priests. Three, make the gift. Why these three things? Because if a person, according to Lord Moses, if a person was healed of leprosy, the only person who could declare him healed was the priest. And if the priest, and for, for that to happen, the man had to go and expose himself to the priest. He had to show him his, his chest, he had to show him his face and his hands. And the priest from this could discern whether the man had been healed. If the priest said yes, the man was then to go and get a lamb and offer it in sacrifice. So here our Lord is saying to the man, to the leper, speak to no man. In other words, do not prejudge, do not anticipate the judgment of the priest. Don't listen to anybody else, but only the priest. Because if he met someone and said, yes, you're clean, the man might not go to the priest. And of course, we know what happened in the case of Naaman, at least Elijah's servant in regard to Naaman. So he says, don't speak to any man. He said, but go, show yourself to the priest. So fulfill the commandments and um, offer the sacrifice, the gift that Moses commanded. So, several things are going to happen. When he goes to the priest, he will show that he, um, his, his chest, his head, and his hands, as was required. The priest would pass judgment. The priest, would, no doubt, would ask, how is it you came to be, clean, to be cleaned? And so, in declaring our Lord clean, the priest would be acknowledging that Christ had done it and therefore would not be ignorant of the claims of our Lord. The fact that he offered the gift also would confirm this. And therefore, the priest could see that our Lord was not against the law, an accusation that we brought later on, nor did he um, uh, try to abrogate or to ignore the authority of the priest. But he was a faithful Jew, subject to the law, as all are. Now notice that our Lord is the lawgiver, but he still obeys the law. And indeed, all those who um, have authority to establish laws should be the first to obey the law and not overrule the law or make exceptions to the law that are unjust, as we currently see happening. And so in this, the fact that our Lord healed by his simple word, I will, indicates his divine nature. But he goes now to Capernaum, and the centurion comes to him. So two things now. First of all, the Jew is healed, and now the Gentile, because our Lord came to join the two, Jew and Gentile, into one body, his church. And so it's very appropriate that these two miracles should follow. And again, in both cases, it's an affirmation of the divinity of our blessed Lord. So arriving in Capernaum, the centurion came, beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant lies at home sick and grievously tormented. The mere manner in which he approaches expresses the man's character. He is a centurion, and therefore he is a man of some importance. In fact, St. Luke tells us he would appear to be a wealthy man because he built the synagogue in Capernaum. He was also evidently close to the Jews. He was sympathetic, 
sympathetic to them, and of course, he'll be sympathetic to their God. But perhaps the rumors had already arrived about our Lord's miracle. The news had reached him. He's full of compassion, which again is unusual, because being someone certainly affluent and certainly in authority, at the time, in fact at any time, they don't really care much about those in the lower ranks. But he is. He is concerned about the situation of the servant because he speaks about him being grievously tormented. And Jesus immediately said, I will come and heal him. Our Lord is willing to go immediately to the house of a Gentile. Again, Jews do not enter the homes of Gentiles. They would regard it as unclean. Remember on, uh, on, the, uh, on Holy Week, on, Holy, uh, on Good Friday, the Jews didn't want to go into the house of Pilate because they would be unclean and able to celebrate the Passover. But our Lord is willing to go. Just as he was ready to touch the, the leper and not be contaminated, so also would he go to the house of Gentile without being contaminated. But the centurion is sensitive. And he recognizes his own unworthiness. And so he responds, Lord, I am not worthy that thou should enter under my roof. He recognizes who he is and in whose presence he is. Just as Peter, when he saw the, the catch of, of fish, said, Depart from me, O Lord, I am a sinful man. Or the woman who said that if she touches just the hem of his garments, is sufficient. She didn't think herself worthy of any more. And he says, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. And so important to these words, that they incorporated into the Mass before we receive communion. And we ought always to remember this, that what we receive, we are not worthy. It is Christ, God himself, who makes us worthy. But he, what does he say? Only say the word, and my servant shall be healed. Well, isn't that correspond to what the letter said? If you want, you can heal me. Here the centurion is saying the same thing using different words. Only say the word, only speak, and it is sufficient. And he gives reasons. So it's not just blind faith, but also he recognizes that there are um, temporal reasons why this should be. And he uses himself as an example. For I'm a man, sub, I'm a man subject to authority. So the key word here is authority. I have soldiers under me. If I say to one, go, he goes. If I say to another, come, he comes. And if I say to a third, do this, it is done. And so he says, this is how it is. But you are God. And therefore you have authority over all things. So if you say to the sickness, depart, it will depart. If you say to the temptation, depart, it will depart. If you say to health, come, it will obey you. Speak, ask, command health to come to my servant, and he will be made whole. If I say to my servant, do this, it is done. And so whatever you say will be done. And this shows a profound faith. So great a faith that we're told Jesus here in it marveled. And he said to the multitudes following him, and he speaks prophetically and he speaks as a warning. Amen, I say to you, I have not found so great faith in Israel. Now, there should have been greater faith in Israel because, one, they were the children of the promise. God had promised Abraham a kingdom. He had promised him that his descendants would inherit this kingdom. The people of Israel were the recipients of many of God's miracles. We think of the, the, the time, their time in Egypt, 
and how God intervened directly and led them out of Egypt. We think of what God had done for them in the wilderness, how he fed them on the quails and on the manna, how he gave them water from the rock. We think of how he introduced them into the promised land, how he was with them when they, def when they defeated the enemies. We think of how he constantly called them back and sent the prophets. He gave them kings. He sent them prophets to correct the kings. He was constantly calling them back. And all of this, there were miracles being worked. So they had no reason not to believe in the miracles and in the signs. Yet our Lord says, he's not found faith as great as the faith of this pagan, the centurion. And then he gives the prophecy. And I say to you, many shall come from the east and from the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So he's speaking about his church, which will embrace Gentiles like the centurion, people from the east and the west who are not descendants of Abraham according to the flesh. And but these will sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But then the warning for the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into the exterior darkness. The children of Abraham according to the flesh, because they do not believe, they will not inherit the kingdom of heaven, but rather they be thrown into the exterior darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so our Lord speaks, I think, for the first time about hell. And this is a serious warning. So when we hear that there is no hell, or if there is a hell, it is empty, we know that this is an outright contradiction to what our Lord says. I think um, he speaks about the exterior darkness, hell, about 15 times in the Gospels. So we should take it seriously. And why? Because there's lack of faith. And then Jesus said to the centurion, Go and, and as thou hast believed, let it be done to thee. Again, showing the, um, the, his will to heal. To his will to satisfy our desires. And the servant was healed at that same hour. So we see this, the... Um, Centurion, moved by compassion, approaches our Lord, not for himself, but for someone else. And the Lord responds, because of the centurion's faith, not the servant. The servant is miles away. Yet, the faith of the centurion was enough to grant him help, to save him. And no doubt, the centurion believed, became a Christian, as did his family, and indeed, the servant who was healed. And so we see here the communion of saints at work. When we ask the saints to intercede for us, they do exactly what the centurion has done. And so when we ask our, our patron saints to intercede for us, to strengthen us against sin, against temptation, when we ask them to obtain for us some favor, some spiritual enlightenment, the saints will intercede. And the Lord, who knows their faith, will say, let it be done. And so our faith is, is so important because it's only by faith we can really approach God. It is through faith, believing in him, who has sent his son to save us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Santa Maria Mater Dei